and welcome to episode 3 of Dielectric Videos. So hopefully you can tell that I've gotten a new camera and the quality should be better. Now I'm shooting in 1080p and 60 frames per second instead of 720p and 30 frames per second. Now today I'm going to discuss the other possible option for making your laboratory or workspace safer, the ground fault circuit interrupter. Now the ground fault circuit interrupter or GFCI is basically a device that compares the amount of current going from the hot back into the neutral and if there's any difference between those it turns the power off. This of course is to make sure that if say you had a toaster plugged in and bumped it into the sink that any current flowing through the pipes and the water that is no longer flowing through the neutral would be accounted for by the GFCI and when it sees that there is an imbalance in current it would trip. This is of course because in a normally functioning power system the neutral and hot should have the same amount of current flowing through them. In fact if you actually look at how a GFCI works it's essentially a toroidal transformer with the two uh, wires hot and neutral running through that transformer. If there's any difference in the current flowing between the two, the transformer will start operating, uh, will start uh, generating a small amount of power and it will trigger an electronic relay to cut the power. Now, you'll see these things usually in bathrooms and kitchens most often, as well as outdoor locations. And a long time ago, or actually quite recently ago, uh, the National Electric Code only required them in so-called wet locations. Nowadays, I believe the National Electric Code requires GFCIs pretty much everywhere. And you'll notice in other countries like the United Kingdom, where they call them RCDs, or residual current devices, sometimes they'll connect the entire house one leg at a time to two giant uh, RCD or GFCI devices. So how exactly does the GFCI work? Well, the first thing you can see are there's these two buttons, the test and the reset button. Essentially, these are a way for you to make sure that your GFCI is functioning properly. It'll say test monthly on here. I don't know anyone who does test these things monthly, but if you're really hardcore like that, totally go for it. It'll make it safer anyway. So to test it, you press the button and, oh, you'll notice my kilowatt meter, which is plugged into the Electropop, is no longer operating. There's no power left on this circuit. And if I press the reset, power is back on. So wait for that to start up. Now, yeah, you can see that it sort of works, but what exactly is this test doing? Is it turning, just turning it on and off like a light switch? Well, no, there's a little bit more to it. The test is essentially putting a dummy load between the either hot and uh, ground or neutral and ground to see what happens. It's bleeding off current. It's actually technically not conducting to ground. It's conducting to the other side of the GFCI on the neutral. That's just to be sure that even if the ground conductor is broken, that the GFCI still works reliably. Now, to demonstrate the actual effects of having a GFCI, I'm going to be using this resistor. Now, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but this is a brown, red, orange resistor, which corresponds to a 12 kilo ohm resistor. Now, if we break out Ohm's law, which is V equals I times R, and solve for the current, you'll get that at 120 volts, this resistor will conduct about 10 milliamps, meaning that it'll dissipate about 1.2 watts, and the 10 milliamps just so happens to be approximately double the trip current of 5 milliamps required for this GFCI to actually take effect. Now, the first thing I'm going to demonstrate is if I connect this between the hot and the neutral, nothing happens. You can sit, sit there all day. The resistor will probably get quite hot, but it's not going to cause any tripping. However, if I connect this between the hot and the ground, oh, it tripped the GFCI as expected. What essentially was happening is a small amount of current, 10 milliamps to be precise, was flowing through this resistor into the earth pin from the hot. Now, since it was flowing from the hot to the earth and instead of the hot to the neutral, the GFCI device was detecting the difference in current and then tripping. Essentially, what it thought was that somebody had dropped the toaster into the sink and the current was now flowing through the sink into the pipes and that was what was causing the issue. Of course, this is just a test, so uh, the GFCI still performed as it would in the actual uh, case of, an, uh, of a hazard. What's really interesting though, 
is the GFCI does not only rely on having this as the only path to ground. The way I connected it, essentially the only current flowing was from hot to ground. There is no current flowing through the neutral. Now what happens if, plugged into my meter here, well, let me reset this first. If I set this meter to amps, uh, like so, and turn on a six or seven amp space heater, a big, huge load, it's gonna go up and it's gonna draw about 6.7 amps according to this. So yeah, a lot of current is flowing now. Do you think it would take proportionately more current now to trip the GFCI? Do you think it's less sensitive as a result of this increased current? Well, the way that this GFCI is designed, it is not. It is just as sensitive. And we can prove that by once again probing the resistor between the hot and the ground. Once again, there it goes. Power is off. GFCI is tripped. So you can now see that regardless of the amount of current flowing through the GFCI, it will still trip in the event that more than 5 milliamps of current is detected in of an imbalance between the hot and the neutral pin. So this really does make your lab station quite a bit safer if you were to accidentally uh, touch something connected to the hot uh, and you're standing on a grounded surface, if enough current flows through your body to actually uh, total up to above five milliamps, it will trip the device. And of course, uh, five milliamps is much lower than the amount of current that would actually be hazardous to your health. So this really does work effectively as a safety precaution. Now that being said, there are certain disadvantages to a GFCI. Uh, for one thing, you absolutely must be certain that all the power coming off the hot pin does return to the neutral pin. You can't have any other parts of your circuit where it goes to ground or to other places. Now this can be especially problematic if you're trying to, say, test between one outlet and another outlet somewhere else in your house, and you're trying to measure, say, the voltage uh, to see if, it's, if they're on different legs. Well, if you do that with GFCIs, if enough current passes between the two, you're going to trip the GFCI because it can't, uh, it detects the imbalance. Other experiments you might do uh, with, if you have radio frequency electronics, sometimes that can cause interference with the GFCI if, it's flo if the current's flowing through it. And sometimes you just get nuisance tripping, meaning that you might just be using your uh, devices like you normally would and all at once it randomly trips on you. So. Those are the three reasons why you might not necessarily want to use a GFCI. If that's the case and you still want your lab station to be safe, you can see, use an isolation transformer as I covered in my previous video. But overall, for most applications, GFCI receptacles and GFCI uh, whole house protection can be a very good way to improve the safety of your lab station or of your workshop. So especially if you're working around water, such as in the kitchen, outside, in the bathroom, or anywhere where you might likely uh, encounter large amounts of uh, exposed, uh, exposed mains power, having a GFCI to protect it is generally a good idea. So if you don't need the power to be extremely reliable uh, in the long run, and you're okay with it tripping occasionally, a GFCI is definitely preferable to an isolation transformer. It's lighter in weight, it costs less, it's easier to implement. The only difference, of course, being that it might trip at random if uh, there's enough leakage current through, say, a long extension cord. Uh, sometimes capacitive leakage can cause this. So it's good to know the pros and cons of having a GFCI or an isolation transformer so that you can decide what is the best option for your laboratory. Thank you for watching dielectric videos. I hope this video was informative and uh, gave you some more information about how you can make your uh, experiment station safer. And thanks for watching.